you're a lawyer attacking other lawyers. How could you I do? I am. I am. <laughs> but I mean, typically, when something's good for lawyers, it's probably not good for everybody else. Hi, I'm Paul Dietrich with Reason TV. Today we're talking with Cal Raustiala. Raustiala is a law professor at UCLA. He's also the co-author of the book, The Knockoff Economy, How Imitation Sparks Innovation. Now, when I think of uh, copycats, I think of them as writing on the coattails of other creative people. Why is that wrong? Well, it's wrong because that's not always true. And in fact, it's often not true. I guess the way I would put it is that a lot of innovation grows out of imitation. So it's not so much riding on the coattails as it is um, um, standing on the shoulders. And what's the difference between counterfeit and copying? It depends on the context, but I'd say in the fashion context, counterfeits usually refer to the label being uh, copied. So for example, you can go to a place like Santee Alley here in Los Angeles, and you can find fake uh, Gucci sunglasses. Those are counterfeits. On the other hand, you could walk into the Forever 21 store nearby and find a knocked off dress, meaning a copy of a design of a dress by Gucci. That's a copy and that's legal. The people that make uh, pants and dresses, what do they have to teach patent lawyers? I mean, I think the biggest lesson to draw out of the fashion industry is that intellectual property rights are not a necessary feature for innovation or for creative work. Certain aspects of intellectual property are very important. So the trademark is really significant and they're very uh, vigilant about trademark. But the designs, as we talked about a moment ago, they're copied freely and legally in this country. And we have a thriving garment industry. Even if you're being copied, then you know you're in style. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you talk to designers, they're all over the map on this issue. Um, but we quote several different designers in the book to say either something like, I'm very glad that I'm copied because if I'm not copied, you know, I'm clearly not in the game. Or, you know, copying is just part of the air we breathe. This is how this industry works. For those that aren't fans of fashion, uh, what can we learn from football and innovation? Well, football is really interesting in this regard because like fashion, football plays and formations are unprotected by copyright law. So you might think of a player formation as kind of a choreographic work, which is protected, but no one's successfully been able to make that claim. So as a practical matter, every time a college uh, coach or a pro coach comes up with a new formation, that is going to be copied if it's successful by their opposition. Uh, and opposing teams do that all the time. So again, this begs the question, why do they keep creating if they know they're going to be copied? Because that's, that is, runs counter to everything we think about intellectual property. And the answer is, it's incredibly competitive in football, and competition itself drives a lot of innovation, one. And two, first mover advantage. The fact that you are the first to use something will often give you enough of an edge to justify that innovation. Because it takes the other team a certain amount of time not just to learn that new player formation, but also to train in it and to adapt it. So that advantage can be significant, and that's true of a lot of industries. I remember in the 90s when I was a kid, I was downloading so much stuff off of Napster. It was this new place to find music, and it was music for free. And then the music industry got caught up in arms over, over time, trying to sue Napster, trying to sue everybody for uh, copyright infringement. How has the music industry innovated itself? Well, I would say they haven't innovated enormously, but there's been some big changes in a few areas. Um, probably the most interesting for this purpose is actually iTunes. So if you look at iTunes, iTunes has had over 10 billion downloads at roughly a dollar a pop. So that's a pretty good business. And Apple has become a huge player in the music industry, whereas it wasn't before. And I think one important lesson there is people are still illegally downloading, for sure. But a lot of people are going to iTunes, and the reason is iTunes makes it super easy to find what you want and relatively cheap to buy it. So I think the lesson is if you take advantage of the internet, rather than viewing it as something that's going to kill you, something that you hate, which is the reaction of the music industry initially to Napster, consumers will follow. And unfortunately for a lot of the record labels, it's a lesson they learned a little too late. Would you say that the copiers were on the cutting edge of the industry? I would say that the part of the problem in our discussions about music, and this is a point we emphasize in the knockoff economy, is that we tend to think of the music industry and music as kind of the same thing. And in fact, they're very different. So from a consumer point of view, we're in a golden age for music. There's tons of music out there. Whatever record store or place you used to go in the, I'm older than you are, let's say in the 80s, pre-internet, uh, couldn't cover a hundredth of the, of the material that you can find on, let's say, just Amazon today, let alone iTunes or something else. From a musician's point of view, in some ways, it's a much easier world. The same technologies that have made illegal downloading possible make it possible to sit in your bedroom with your uh, computer uh, and maybe a couple of software programs, um, create an entire album, and distribute it online to the world. 
without going into a studio, without signing a contract with a record label, without having to deal with any of those intermediaries. The point that I want to make about music, and it goes across the board, is that copying has destructive effects, and the music industry, the music labels, exemplify that. But it also has productive effects, and the freedom to copy, the ability to copy, has had both good and bad elements, and I think music is a wonderful exemplar of that. What kind of innovation comes from uh, the food we eat at restaurants? We live at an incredibly creative time for food. I would say probably the greatest time in history. There's more amazing ideas. I'm about to go over to Roy Choi's restaurant, Chego. Roy Choi is the inventor of the Korean taco, uh, known as Kogi. Is the he Kogi the inventor, truck. though? Is he the inventor of tacos and, uh, and Korean food? There is some dispute. There is some dispute, <laughs> uh, but I'll say uh, that he is okay. um, for the purposes of this discussion. He, he is certainly the leading popularizer of it and probably the inventor of the particular Kogi taco that we know today. Very popular in Los Angeles and it's now spread all over the country. So cuisine is a creative field and there's a lot of knocking off and it's perfectly legal like the fashion industry. You can copy a recipe completely legally. You can go and say, hey, I wanna create my own taco truck and I'm gonna call it bogey and it's gonna look just like that, I'm gonna serve the same things. You can do that as long as you are not um, confusing consumers who think it's Kogi, perfectly legal. Nonetheless, there's a lot of creativity. Who knows tomorrow or right now what new form of taco is being created? So I think the biggest lesson is that um, intellectual property law is not uh, as important as we might think to innovation. So in the patent context, um, patents can be very important in certain areas, especially when you have big upfront costs. And we are forthright about that in the book. We recognize that not every industry is the same. But still, there is innovation even in areas where patents normally apply. And you might question whether we need all the patents that we have um, or whether patents should be as broad. So, for example, in the Apple-Samsung case that just happened, um, Apple claims a patent in the rectangular design of the iPad and the iPhone. They own a rectangle, you mean? They try to say that they own the rectangle. The jury upheld that for the phone. It sort of split the difference on the iPad. It didn't say that Samsung infringed, but it also didn't say the patent was invalid. It's a bigger rectangle. It's a bigger rectangle. Now, um, what's interesting about that is, of course, um, you're holding a piece of paper. Um, I've got a book. All those things are rectangular. I think when Moses brought the tablets down, they were rectangular. We've been kind of working with the rectangle as a content shape for a long time. So the notion that Apple should be able to lock that up uh, against anything that's uh, quite similar for 14 years, um, I think is a sign that maybe we've stepped over the reasonable boundary. Unemployment is still very high. Is there anything that we can learn from copying that can help bring us jobs? I guess if I knew that, I'd be on the phone with Barack Obama, but um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think so. I do think, I'll say one thing on that topic, which is just to go back to fashion. So back in 1946, I think, Maurice Rentner, who then was a leading figure in the New York fashion industry, former head of the Fashion Originators Guild, declared that unless Congress took action to create a copyright for fashion designs, the industry would lose 600,000 jobs. Now, fast forward to 2012, and you hear those same figures bandied around. If we don't do something, we're gonna lose all these jobs. In the intervening decades, the industry grew and grew and became very successful. So one lesson I draw from that is when an industry is doing well without intellectual property protection, we don't want to introduce that. And that might have detrimental effects for innovation, but also might have detrimental effects for unemployment, or rather for employment. I don't have a magic bullet for increasing jobs in the United States, um, but I don't think increasing jobs for lawyers, which is what a bill like that would do, is the best way to increase jobs for the economy as a whole. You're a lawyer attacking other lawyers. How could you I do? I am. I am. <laughs> but I mean, typically when something's good for lawyers, it's probably not good for everybody else. I think that's a good rule of thumb to operate with. Well, that's a good place to go out on. Uh, for Reason TV, I'm Paul Dietrich.